Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, give us a call, 208-991-4783. And become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, last uh, week... Uh, we left off with the first show of 1952 from January 5th. Well, this episode was rec- uh, was aired six months later uh, on July the 2nd. However, there was only one episode in between. On January 12th, the Baxter matter aired, and then after that, Johnny Dollar left the air. In terms of the reasons for this, I couldn't find any airtight explanations. But here's what uh, it looks like. At this point in his career, Edmund O'Brien was becoming a bona fide star. He was only a couple years away from his first uh, Academy Award. And 1951 had marked a historic year for radio and television. It was the first year that television brought in more advertising revenue than radio. And there was a lot of money for actors to appear on television. At the same time, radio stations had to begin to pare down their uh, uh, budgets to survive. So that economic dynamic on the part of O'Brien and or CBS probably had a lot more to do with Johnny Dollar leaving the air than concerns over something such as ratings. Given that CBS invited Edmund O'Brien back uh, to do a summer series of Johnny Dollar. And this was actually the second of four years that CBS did this sort of thing. In 1950, Philip Marlowe was canceled, and in 1951, Gerald Moore returned with a summer series. Uh, Richard Nyman, in 1953, had been off the air for some time, but CBS actually went ahead and ran uh, reruns in the summer of 1953. And in 1953, Broadway's My Beat was canceled, but were returned in the summer of 1954. This was the second of four years that this occurred. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to take a listen to this episode. Our last uh, chance to hear from Edmund O'Brien is uh, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. But before we do, I want to encourage you, as you make your travel plans, remember JohnnyDollarAir.com. JohnnyDollarAir.com is powered by Priceline. So you can save money by either naming your own price on hotels, rental cars, airline tickets, and even more. Or you can choose from great published fares or save even more money by uh, getting a package of uh, such as hotel and airline ticket or hotel, airline ticket, and rental car. And you help to support the great detectives of old time radio. Well, here now is the very last episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, featuring Edmund O'Brien. It's the Amelia Harwell Matter. The treat that gives you chewing enjoyment presents for your listening enjoyment Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. George Parker, Johnny. Corinthian Allred. Sure, George. How are you? We need an investigator. Can you take a case for us? I've been sitting here waiting for one. You've got it. Big policy holder on Cape Cod, Mrs. Thomas Harwell. She died from poison. Hmm, that's rare these days. I'll be over in about 30 minutes. Listen to the rest of it. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you Edmund O'Brien in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. Yes, for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, it's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. The good, smooth chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Corinthian Old Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Amelia Harwell matter. 
Expense account item one, two fifty. Cab fare from my apartment to the Corinthian building in the office of George Parker. Well, first, do you know the Harwell name? I made a textile station? That's right. Mm. Strange sort of family. Fortune was built by the deceased father. She was his only child. He naturally had wanted the son to carry on the name and the business. So he trained her, Amelia. She took the man's place all her life. How old was she? Something over 70. And did she still head up the business at that age? She took a very active part. What about the poison? I haven't gotten any of the details on that. That'll be up to you. Anything on the surviving family? Yes, yes. I have it here. Mm. Husband, Thomas, the daughter, Maxine, and son, Dexter. Here, you keep it. Got the ages and all. Thanks. From what I can gather, she was an extremely domineering woman. Ran her household like a factory. There must have been very little warmth toward her. And when you consider the fortune she's leaving and the insurance... How much did she carry? Too much. 150000 for the family and over 200000 with the corporation as beneficiary. Well, that kind of money you should have hired me earlier as a bodyguard. Defense account item two, forty dollars car rental and twenty-two dollars fuel and incidentals between Hartford and the Harwell Estate on the eastern shore of the Cape near South Wellesley. The mansion was as solid as the family's Dun and Bradstreet rating. Heavy brick construction with turrets, shuttered windows, and massive double doors that opened into a coldly formal entry hall. The widower Thomas, as might have been expected, is the rabbit type. Pinch glasses, high stuff collar with spring tie and sparse hair. It's announced to him in the library where, from the wall, a life size portrait of Mrs. Harwell seemed to be keeping an eye on the proceedings. Well, how do you do, Mr. Dollar? Nice of you to see me, Mr. Harwell. That will be all, Brighton. Yes, sir. You close the door, Brighton. Yes, sir. Please sit down, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. Well, these things are always hard to start, Mr. Harwell. I'm accustomed to bluntness, Mr. Dollar. Besides, I've talked about Mrs. Harwell for almost 50 years. I see no reason to hesitate now, because she's dead. She was poisoned, you know. Yes, I've heard. But I don't think she minded. You don't think she minded? Mrs. Harwell was an invalid. She had a very short time to live. I didn't know that. Well, very few people did. She hardly admitted it to herself. Mrs. Harwell was a very strong woman, one who despised weakness, yet made everyone around her weak. Neither of these coins have been released to the papers, the illness or the poison. No. Due to a friendly gesture by the police, she has been spared notoriety. She wouldn't like it to be known, so it isn't. Was she in pain, Mr. Howell? She never told me. Do you think she could have taken the poison herself? I hardly think so. That would have been an admission of defeat. I see. Do you have any idea how she could have gotten the poison, then? You're asking me if I suspect the children. You're finding it difficult to do so. Is that correct? It's hardly a pleasant thing to bring up. The time for delicacy has passed. I'm afraid I don't approve of my daughter or my son at all. Oh? They're the worst sort of rich men's children. Or rich women's, I should say. I was never allowed to be their father. All they've had is a mother. They have no gumption, no ambition. They've been overly educated and have developed nothing but insatiable lust for their mother's money. And it's too late to change them. Without it, they could not exist. I understand they live here. They do. I should have Brighton call them to the drawing room, if you wish. That won't be necessary right now. What about the servants? Well, there are eight. This is how well settled a small amount on each. But unfortunately, they are above suspicion. They are common people, and the result's good. Did Mrs. Howell have a nurse? She wouldn't hear of it. There's certainly a doctor, then. Yes, Dr. Stevens in the village. Mm. Thanks, Mr. Howell. I won't take up any more of your time. You're welcome any time, Mr. Dollar. Please give Dr. Stevens my regards. Mr. Dollar, the Harwell case passes from my hands into yours. I wish you more success than I've had. Thanks, Doctor. Amelia was not only a hopeless cancer victim, but she was a stubborn old fool. I could have saved her life with surgery three years ago, but I made the mistake of advising her, and advice was something she could not accept. You've been friendly with them that long? I tended them longer than that, but friendly as hard as the word. I brought each of their children into the world, but have yet to use the given names of any of them in their presence, Peggy. Hmm. Oh, I'm glad to talk to somebody like you. I found talking to the old man a little rough. I'm used to survivors being sad about death or suspicious or something. I'm afraid that with Thomas, instead of a feeling of grief, it's something akin to passing from slavery into freedom. And the children, are they as worthless as he makes them out? I'd say so. Maxine, the oldest, is a bitter, frustrated old maid of 33. And Dexter, 32, is an alcoholic. 
and has just entered into an unsuccessful marriage. Do you think either of them could have killed their mother? I'm in no position to accuse any of them, but there is the inheritance and your insurance. My household. How long would you have lived? Hard to say. Two months, a couple of three. Your family know that? I've been honest with them. Then why kill for profit? I don't know. Could it have been a mercy killing? I've wondered. It doesn't sound like them. To take a risk like that, but it's a possibility. What kind of poison was it? I don't know. I've been asked to attend the inquest this afternoon. If you'd like to call me at home this evening, I'd be glad to tell you what I've learned. Thanks, Doctor. I will. So far, except for lining the family up and accusing them one by one, I can't seem to map out a move. What about this marriage you mentioned? Dexter? I don't know much about it. The girl's name is Dexter Neesby. He owns a small photographic studio just down the street. Small business, huh? It's below hollow standards, isn't it? That is probably the cause of the trouble. And I don't doubt that Amelia wouldn't let her in the house. Through the plate glass window of the studio, Gretchen Nielsen looked like a girl anyone would enjoy having around the house. She lived up to her Nordic name, fine straight features, warm blue eyes, the look of strength about her. I got her home address and knocked at the door of a small house 15 minutes after she arrived home that evening. Miss Nielsen? Yes? Yeah. I guess I should have said Mrs. Harwell. My name is Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator working on the elder Mrs. Harwell's death side. I'd like to talk with you. Well, I don't know anything about it. Why have you come here? Because I haven't found any place else to go. I'd rather not talk to you. Why not? There are things you don't want to say? All right. Come on in. I'm surprised I haven't been questioned before this. Police haven't started yet. Probably why you haven't. I suppose that means I can expect to be dragged into it, either. I'd imagine so, yes. You can sit over here. You know she was poisoned, don't you? Yes, I... Didn't until Bryden the butler told me I read about the death in the paper and phoned out there. Why aren't you living there with your husband? You have no right to ask me things like that, have you? You don't have to answer my questions, but it might be a good idea to get things out in the open. Why? Because there has to be a reason for Mrs. Harwell to die the way she did. Would your marriage to Dexter be behind it in some way? I don't see how. Wouldn't they let you and Dexter live together in the house? I didn't give them a chance to let me. They knew I'd never live there. What did they tell you? What did they say about the fortune hunter who lured and trapped their only son? You weren't mentioned. That's hard to believe. Why isn't Dexter here with you? Because he's a slave. He's too weak to be anything else. I hate myself for saying that, but it's true. Why'd you marry him? Because I love him. I thought we had something that would drag him away from that family that smothers him. But when the time came, he wouldn't leave him. Why not? Because his mother never taught him to do anything but hold out his hand for the money that was always there for the taking. He's uh, due to commit some money of his own now. Quite a chunk. You led the conversation to this point, didn't you? Dexter would never kill for the money. There has to be a reason why she died. I think her husband did it. Why? To stop her suffering. I caught her off guard a few times. I know she was in pain. And I know she was frightened. Probably for the first time in her life. I think he knew that too and wanted to help. That could be. First, you sounded like you hated her. Now you don't. I feel sorry for her. Because she made so many mistakes. And now she's dead and there's nobody to correct them. <laughs> I didn't string out my meeting with Gretchen Harwell and May Nielsen. I left, went to my hotel, and at seven, phoned Dr. Stevens. His report on the inquest brought out, among other things that didn't seem important at the time, this point. The cause of death was a non-alkaloid poison, administered in suicide or by person or persons unknown. The poison was hardly the type to choose, either for suicide or a mercy killing. With what I had, I went out back to the Harwell residence. I'm sorry, sir. Mr. Harwell has retired. The rest of the family are? Yes, sir. I wonder if you'd tell them that I'd like to see them. Very well, sir. If you'll wait in the library, I'll tell them you're here. And this is my sister, Maxine. How do you do? How do you do? Now, 
What do you want? I understand both of you were here the night your mother died. Yes. yes. I've just gotten the verdict of the inquest. The poison that killed her was not a pleasant one. Did any of you hear any sound shortly before your mother was discovered dead? I didn't, and I found her. I went in to bid her good night. I didn't hear anything. It was in my room. Where's Anne? Just down the hall from mother's. What's the meaning of this anyway? The point is that your mother would have cried out. The poison would have been... Uh, what's that? It's father. He's in his room. Something's wrong. I'm going up to see. I went with him. We found Mr. Howell in bed, clawing his throat and staring at the ceiling. When I bent over him, he moved a hand towards a glass of water on the bedside table. I picked it up and smelled it. I'm no chemist, but I didn't need to be to know that he'd been poisoned. Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes your job seem easier. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint Gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving, when you're enjoying outdoor sports and other activities. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum tastes good anytime, and the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. <laughs> Now, with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we bring you the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. I tried to read something in the expressions of the son and the daughter as we stood for a moment around their father's bed. There wasn't much in them. No surprise, no fear, no satisfaction. Maxine looked a little embarrassed and left the phone Dr. Stevens. Dexter looked a little vague and said he thought he knew where a medical book was. And I was left alone with Thomas Harwell. I'm all right. I'm all right. Call them back, Mr. Dollar. I'm all right. I won't die. Of course you won't. I'm all right. How much water did you drink? Not very much. I was so thirsty, too. But I think I smelled it. I only said... I felt a terrible burning in my throat. I could hardly breathe. Who, who would do this to me? I was hoping you could tell me, Mr. Harwell... We won't talk about it now. Dr. Stevens is coming out to have a look at you. Mm. I'm glad he's been called. He's my friend. Anything I can do for you in the meantime? No, no, thank you. I'm going to be all right. I'm not ready to follow him either. I'm not ready yet. I took the glass of poison water with me when I left the room. I put it on a table in the hallway outside his door and stayed with it until Dr. Stevens arrived. He spent about 15 minutes with Mr. Harwell, and then he joined me. All right. Mr. Tennis. I sent downstairs. Good. You said you had the glass? Yeah, sure. Now look. Hmm. There must be enough poison to kill a hundred people. He's a very fortunate man. Can you tell if it's the same stuff that killed his wife? Mm, I'd say yes. Canadine or some such. What did he say to you? Very little. I'm only his doctor, you know. But he did tell me that it was unnecessary for this to be reported to the police. Oh? I told him it would be absolutely unethical if I didn't. Sounds to me as though he's trying to protect the children. I guess they used to, eh? By the way, did you notice the marks on his throat? No. Looks as if somebody has tried to strangle him. Strange, I didn't notice. Will they all right if I talk to him now? Oh, I think so. I gave him a very mild sedative, but it won't go to work for a while. Uh, do you want me to wait? Not unless you think you should. He doesn't need me any longer... And if you'll stay here in case of another attempt... I will. I'll call you if anything develops. All right. Good night, Mr. Dollar. Good night, Doc. Yes? How are you feeling, Mr. Howell? Quite well, thank you. Quite well. I'm glad you came back, Mr. Dollar. I want to talk to you. I'm glad to hear that. I, I spoke to him, Dr. Feeling. About not reporting this to the police? Yes. Why must he be so uncooperative? Why don't you want the police to know? 
Because no matter how serious the purpose was, the results were harmless. I want the subject dropped. Are you afraid of what police investigation might bring out? For the sake of the family reputation, I do not want their meddling. I intend to manage this in my own way. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to discharge all of the servants. You told me earlier that they were all about suspicion. Do you remember? Oh, in this attempt upon my life, I thought they were. It's hard to understand, Mr. Harwell. If you really think that one of the servants tried to poison you, you must realize that the same one killed your wife. Still, you want the matter dropped. I do. Amelia is gone. And I see no possibility that she will return because I bring about for myself and my family the unpleasantness of police interference. Well, you may believe in your logic, but I'm sorry it won't work. It'll have to be reported. Then, young man, leave this house. I didn't want you here. You will not be allowed under this roof again. All right, Mr. Howell. Good night. I picked up my glass of evidence again and started downstairs. When I got to the entry hall, I heard voices and looked into the library to see the children, Maxine and Dexter. Their conversation had ended by the time I walked in. How is he? He's all right. Back to normal. What are you doing with that glass? I'm taking it to the police. They want to know if it's the same poison that killed your mother and there's a chance of finding fingerprints. Mm. Right. Here we go again. Your father didn't want me to take it to the police. Why shouldn't he want to report that somebody tried to kill him? Because he's afraid that one of us did it. Is that what you mean? Mm, it's come to mind. Get out of here, darling. I don't have to listen to this. Wait, Dexter. Wait a minute. That's what he thinks. The police are going to, too. Then I'll listen to them. It's their business, but not his. I don't have anything to be afraid of. I didn't keep a three-month-old marriage secret like you wanted me to. Dexter. And I didn't break the news to her by telling her that she was going to be a grandmother like you wanted me to. You think everything's wrong. Dexter, shut up. You're drunk. Oh, let him accuse you. I'm not going to listen to him. I'm going to bed. He drinks too much. Is what he said true? About the baby? Yes, it's true. And he's living here? Obviously. And his wife, she seems to deserve better. Yes, she does. Dexter was here waiting for Mother to die. So he knew she'd disinherit him if he moved out. And now, neither one of us had better say any more until we got legal counsel. I took the poison to the police and made a statement. Then I went back to my hotel. Two or three phone calls to Gretchen Harwell. The next morning, I found her at a studio before the day's work began. What are you doing here? I tried to reach you last night and couldn't. What do you want? Somebody tried to poison Mr. Harwell. Oh, he's all right? Yes, I phoned you a number of times last night, but there was no answer. I was out. I stayed with the girlfriend. And you left a few things unsaid the last time we talked. Didn't you? You found out about the baby. Yeah. And you've come to congratulate me. How nice. I've been simply swamped with congratulations. Please, this has to be straightened out, and everything that's held back makes it harder. What does the baby have to do with it? Well, it makes a motive stronger than ever for Dexter. He wouldn't kill his mother. I was told he'd be disinherited if he left the family man's because of the marriage you kept secret. Where did you hear that? Came out last night. He didn't kill his mother. How about trying to kill his father? No. He was trying to help us. The father? Doesn't sound quite right. I know it doesn't, but it's true. Dexter didn't even realize it, but I did to him. Mr. Harwell had never done anything in his life, but he tried to help us. Why? Because when he married her, he must have had a personality. His mother didn't approve of Dexter and me, but I think his father did. You didn't keep it a secret from him? For a little while, until I insisted that we tell him. And he kept it from me. Do you know why? Because he was the dictator. When she was sick, she was worse. She'd think Dexter had waited until she was helpless before marrying the girl he wanted to. But she found out and was poisoned before she could do anything like dropping Dexter from her will. I don't care. I don't care. I'll even say that Dexter did have reason to kill his mother. But he never would. And not his father. You aren't trying to protect him, are you? Of course I'm not. I don't care how much I love him. I wouldn't want him if he were a murderer. I did a lot of thinking after I left her. It would have been easy to be swayed by her, and I took that into consideration. In my hotel room, I tried to line up all the points that had come out. Only two of them added. By phone, I tried him on Dr. Stevens. He was more agreeable than I'd expected him to be. Just before noon the next day, when once more I walked through the Harwell's front door. 
In here, sir. They're waiting for lunch. Mr. Dollar. That will be all right. Yes, sir. Mr. Dollar, I thought I told you not to enter this house again. You did, Mr. Howell. But I thought the fact that I might save one of your children from a murder trial might make a difference. Which one, if I may ask, Dexter? I don't understand. I think we've had enough of this, Mr. Dollar. My family has been quite upset since you've arrived. I think we've had enough, too, Mr. Howell. I wonder if I could talk to you in private. Who are you to ask that? No, Dexter, I think I agree with him. Please leave. But, Father, I You, too, Maxine. All right, Dad. Come on, Dexter. Sure. See if Dollar can tell him anything worse about me than he knows. Well, Mr. Dollar, you wouldn't like to see Dexter charged with the murder of your wife, would you? Of course I wouldn't. The police are ready to do it. And they've got a good case. You didn't think of that, did you? I beg your pardon? You didn't realize that you might set up a situation that would jeopardize your son. I don't think I understand. I think you do. You killed your wife, didn't you? I? You filled a glass of water last night to throw off suspicion and to get rid of the evidence at the same time. Mr. Dollar! If you didn't, Dexter is going to be brought to trial. I can promise you that. I saw the charges being drawn. They have everything against him, except two or three things. Oh, what are they? Something that was hidden behind those tall collars of yours. Scratches on your neck. Another thing that came out at the inquest. Bits of flesh under your wife's fingernails. And the fact that your children didn't hear anything the night she died. They all go together. You struggled to keep her quiet, and she scratched you. You're a very observing young man, aren't you? Not necessarily, but certain things add up. Am I right? I could hardly deny it now. Yes. It made such a little difference to Amelia. Though I don't imagine the officials take that into consideration. They seldom do. But it made such a great difference in Gretchen's child. I've made many mistakes with my own children through deference to my wife. I'd hope that I could help my grandchildren through strength. Strength enough to do what I have done a child through Dexter. I had hoped that Amelia, when she knew that a life was being given while hers was being taken, would be glad to prove what she didn't. She asked for a lawyer so that she could change her will, and I knew what I had to do. I'm sorry, Mr. Howell. There are many things to regret, Mr. Dollar, many things. But hastening my wife's death, her life was decayed. The life she did not want that I did want was so fresh and new that it doesn't even know what hope or helplessness can be. Forgive me, Amelia. <laughs> Forgive me. Expense account item three, miscellaneous, $35.85. Item four, same as item two, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $122.35. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied, makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself often to Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Edmund O'Brien can soon be seen starring in the Paramount Pictures production, The Turning Point. Featured in tonight's cast were Victor Perrin, John McIntyre, Herb Butterfield, Jeanette Nolan, Virginia Gregg, and Peter Lee. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, 
is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. We invite you to join us next week at the same time when, from Hollywood, Edmund O'Brien returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Welcome back. Well, I had a sense that it was the the husband who did it. Uh, from the moment that the um, uh, that we learned about the alleged strangling, it just did not seem um, uh, realistic that he would have avoided the poison that way. And I think in the O'Brien run, if they were anything, they were certainly uh, realistic. As for the series. This, while this is the last Edmund O'Brien episode we have, it was not the last episode that O'Brien did. This was a ten-week series. Four weeks were uh, made up of two repeats each of the Yankee Pride and matter and the Montevideo matter. And the Yankee Pride matter, if I found that, even though it was a repeat, I'd play it again because that was such a great episode. Uh, then there was also the Henry Page matter. The new Bedford Morgue matter, the Sydney Mann uh, matter, the Tom Hickman matter, the Edith Maxwell matter. Uh, so that was all that mattered. And this is the longest consecutive stri uh, string in Johnny Dollar of lost episodes. O'Brien, of course, was on the cusp of, uh, as we mentioned, real stardom, Oscars, Golden Globe ahead. O'Brien played the title role in another private investigator series with a star named, uh, or lead character named Johnny, Johnny Midnight. Also played lawyer Sam Benedict. Uh, but more than anything else, he was known for the great uh, character roles he took on. He was a guest on a wide variety of different uh, programs and performed in many Golden Age anthology series. Uh, on television, he received his star on the Walk of Fame. Actually, two of them. Uh, one for uh, motion pictures and one for television. Made a lot of great uh, films. Was in uh, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance and uh, The Wild Bunch. But we will hear from Edmund O'Brien again. He was actually the first choice to play the lead in Not Beat. Plus, at least one of his uh, suspense performances will eventually be one of our specials. But until then, uh, that's it for Edmund O'Brien. All right, well, I want to let you know about the movie that's coming up this week. It's not a movie, but a TV episode from that golden age. It's uh, the General Electric Theater presentation of a uh, story that originally aired on Box 13. It's called Committed, and it stars Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. This is somewhat fitting, as Box 13 was our first show uh, when we started uh, after the pilot. Uh, the first show we podcast on October 26th of uh, 2009. So this seemed a fitting choice for this month, and I hope you will uh, enjoy that. A couple scary scenes, but uh, no real big uh, parental advisories on this one. Got a comment here from uh, Jim who says, uh, You commented about the restrooms in the Chevron ad. I remember in the 50s a lot of attention was paid to the cleanness of uh, restrooms by all the oil companies in their advertising. Also, they were running promotions, giving away a plate with a fill-up, uh, then selling the service pieces. Uh, marketing of petroleum products has certainly changed in the last in the uh, last 60 years. Remember, full service pump gas, uh, wash windows, check water, oil, and tires. Uh, definitely uh, before my time. Uh, one funny story on this: uh, I was actually you know, driving through the state of Oregon, and they pump your gas in the state of Oregon, uh, but they don't do all the other full service stuff. So I was kind of sitting there like, well, "What type of full service is this?" Uh, and it turns out you're not allowed to pump your own gas in the state of Oregon. And then I became offended about that. Yeah, I can pump my own gas. <laughs> That's all you're going to do. Uh, now I have not seen full service. It's definitely changed a lot. 
Uh, he comments further, I've been listening uh, since the early days of Dragnet. Keep up the good work. And P.S. to me, these programs are nostalgic. And I'm sure quite a few listeners would share the sentiment. And it's not just uh, nostalgic for people who may have first had the opportunity to hear the program. But uh, I've had some people contact me and say, you know, I remember when I was uh, growing up, that uh, we would drive down the interstate, me and my dad, and we would listen to the old time uh, radio uh, at night. So even there, that uh, shared experience. Well, thank you so much from Jim. I appreciate you listening over there in Oklahoma. We will be back on Monday with Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. And we'll be back next Friday to introduce you to a new Johnny Dollar in John Lund. In the meanwhile, uh, uh, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And give us a call, 208-991-4783. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.